Science fiction has an impact on the way we think about our world and about our possible futures. But let me back up a second. Um, we often think about science fiction as being about the future. Right? We, we look at these books written by people who um, have you know, told us about spaceships and um, robots and about all kinds of other futuristic kinds of scenarios and we think this is predicting the future. Uh, another author uh, who was here several years ago, Cory Doctorow, has said that science fiction isn't trying to predict the future. Science fiction is trying to predict the present. And so science fiction is more about what we're worried about currently, projected forward into a possible future. So if we look at science fiction as being about the present, we can say that really what is happening in a lot of robot science fiction is us worrying about and thinking through problems that we have right now. That is where machines are more and more becoming social actors in our world, where they're not just tools that we use to get the job done, but they're rather actual objects that are somewhat marginally intelligent, that are making decisions that have an effect on us. And as a result, we're not quite sure what to do with these things. We're not quite sure what the future will bring with objects that are increasingly intelligent and that are increasingly making decisions for us about our world and about our, our life. So let me give you a really good example of how this happens because we think about this in terms of like, I think, big questions like drones or, you know, robot armies and things like this. But no, it's small things, really small things. So right now, 75% of all films, all movies, all television content that is watched by you and I at Netflix comes because a machine told you to watch it. Not because your friends told you to watch it, not because you told yourself to watch it, but because an algorithm at Netflix said you might like this movie. And then you get it, you watch it, and you say, yeah, it's right. And so machines are helping construct our culture by shaping what we see, what we don't see. And as a result, they are taking an active role in shaping our world. And so the science fiction authors are looking at this and saying, all right, if we blow this up on a big screen, a big scale, what could it look like? And so I think books like Robo Apocalypse, uh, films like uh, you know the Star Wars films, the Star Trek films, television programs like Battlestar Galactica, they're all working with this concept of what does it mean to have machines socially active and taking active roles in our lives. So the backdrop of all of these novels and all of these movies is the Asimov iRobot series. And Asimov invented what he called the three laws of robotics, which were three programming principles to help robots behave accordingly in our society. So the laws are organized in sort of descending order. The first law is the primary law, then the second law is the secondary law, and the third is the tertiary law. But it goes like this. It says that a robot shall not harm a human being or through inaction cause harm to happen to a human being. So it's sort of a no harm law. The second law is that robots will always follow orders given to them by a human being, unless of course that order contradicts the first law. So you can't tell a robot to kill your friend. You can tell a robot to uh, help fix your friend's car or to help your friend make dinner, but you can't tell the robot to do something that is against the first law. So the first law is no harm, the second law is obey orders, and the third law is a self-protection law, which says a robot shall protect its own self-interest and its own life, in all cases, except where it invalidates the first or the second law. So you can see how the laws are kind of connected together. Now, Asimov invented these laws as a way to sort of generate stories. So he looked at it as a way of creating conflict. So he'd write stories where a robot had a conflict with the second law, and there would be a story written around that conflict, or the robot would have a conflict with the first law versus the third law, right? So the self-protection of the robot was, uh, you know, going to kill a human being. So what, what was that dilemma? What, what could be done about that? Since Asimov has, done the th has, has written the, the three laws, a lot of people have tried to actually use them. So you have some roboticists recently, like Michael and Susan Anderson, um, out of the University of uh, New Hampshire, who have tried to create computer programs that actually run Asimov's three laws. And they've had some good results with it. They've tried to make it computable. Um, some people think it's not fully feasible as an engineering principle. Others think it is. And so there's this, uh, I think, as a starting point, the Asimov's laws are sort of the baseline of machine morality, as we call it. All right, so we gotta talk about what is AI, right? So AI is artificial intelligence. 
and a smart guy by the name of Ellen Turing, who was a British mathematician during uh, the Second World War, asked this question. He said, how, how would you know whether a machine was intelligent? What would be the benchmark? What would be the way that you would uh, measure intelligence uh, in a machine? And he came up with a test. He called the Turing test. And the reason we have the test is because of the following. I know I'm intelligent because I know my own thoughts and my own inner operations. But how do I know you're intelligent? How do I know when I look out in the world and I see other things walking around that look kind of like I look, how do I know those are intelligent things? Well, the usual answer is you talk to them. And as you interact and you talk and you converse, you learn they have thoughts and they have ideas and they have feelings. And as a result, you share certain things. And you, in the process of conversing with them, surmise that yes, indeed, they're also an intelligent creature. Alan Turing said that we do the same with a computer. The way you would know a computer or a robot is intelligent is that you'd have to talk to it. You'd have to be able to converse with it and know its thoughts in conversation. So he had this test and he said, okay, we'll know a machine is intelligent when it can fool a human being in thinking that that person's talking to another person. So he had this scenario. He said, put a guy in a room and another guy in another room and have them converse on computer keyboard using texting. And if you can, you know, figure out it's another person, then you, you know, that, that, that person is intelligent and whatever. So he says, okay, now get rid of that person and put a machine in that room. Can the machine fool the person into thinking that it's another person? And he said, you'll know you have intelligence when that machine can fool a human in conversation. And it happened this week. <laughs> so some Russian scientists have created a computer that in conversation with other people, trick them into thinking they're talking to an actual person. And that is called the Turing test. And this date in July, uh, you know, the first couple weeks in July are, are now considered the time at which the computer has passed the Turing test. So we're at that point.